Imagine, if you will, that one day you went into work and there was someone sitting in your seat. You're driving home and someone has parked their car in your garage. You go to use your phone and find that someone else's face will be needed to unlock it. This was, in the loosest possible terms based on these terrible examples, the case for the leader of the Roman Catholic Church. At times, between the 3rd and mid-15th centuries, there were more than one Pope on the go at one time. The reasons behind these scenarios are numerous, but it all leads to confrontation and conflict within the Catholic Church. Over the course of some 1100 years, there were times when papal authority was divided in two, maybe even three. How could this have happened? Who were the individuals and groups involved in this? And what would the Apostle Peter have thought about it all? Obviously, we can't answer the last question. I am Daniel, this is Cogito Ergo Pod, and in this episode, I'm going to get my massive geek on by discussing the antipopes of the Roman Catholic Church. To begin with, it is vital to understand that according to the Catholic Church, there is no power on earth which may depose a Pope. However, that has never stopped temporal or earthly powers from trying to do this in the past. Any duly elected Pope remained in office until he died or resigned, as has happened over seven times. Anyone, therefore, who claims to be Pope while a duly elected Pope is living and has not resigned, is, therefore, an anti-pope. Papal election procedures are governed by the prescription of the last pope who provided for them. That is, any pope can change them, but they remain in effect until they are changed by a duly elected pope. During the first thousand years of the history of the papacy, the electoral were the clergy of Rome, priests and deacons. During the second thousand years, they have had the College of Cardinals, but each pope, having unlimited sovereign power as head of the church, can prescribe any method for the election of his successors that he chooses. These methods must be followed in the next election after the death of the pope who prescribed it, and thereafter until they are changed. A papal claimant not following these methods is also an antipope. By definition, an antipope, from the Latin meaning rival pope or counterpope in the Roman Catholic Church, was one who opposes the legitimately elected Bishop of Rome, endeavouring to secure the papal throne and to some degree succeeding materially in the attempt. Here was someone who made a significant and substantial attempt to occupy the position of the Bishop of Rome and leader of the Catholic Church in opposition to a legitimately elected one. At times between the 3rd and mid-15th centuries, Antipopes were supported by important factions within the church itself and by secular rulers. The elections of several antipopes are greatly obscured by incomplete or biased records, and at times even their contemporaries could not decide who was the true pope. It is impossible, therefore, to establish an absolute definitive list of antipopes, but it is generally conceded that there are at least 37 from 217 CE to 1439 CE. But who are these 37 papal impostors, you ask? I think we need to have a look at at least some of them. Who are they? What did they do? Why did they become an anti-pope to begin with? To begin, we will start with a person considered by many to have been the first anti-pope, Saint Hippolytus. Now, before I start getting hate mail from early church historians and experts, yes, I know Natalius is considered by some to be the first antipope, but the only information we have about Natalius is a quote from an unnamed earlier writer being quoted again by Eusebius, telling of a third century priest who accepted the bishopric of the Adoptionists, which was seen as a heretic group in Rome. Natalius soon repented and tearfully begged Pope Zephyrinus to receive him into communion. So there. With that, it's time to get back to St. Hippolytus. As one of the most prolific writers of the early church, Hippolytus played a crucial role. However, it is impossible to obtain any definitive, authentic facts concerning Hippolytus and his life from the conflicting statements about him. 
Eusebius says that he was a bishop of a church somewhere and enumerates several of his writings. St. Jerome likewise describes him as a bishop of an unknown see, giving a longer list of his writings and says of one of the homilies that he delivered it in the presence of Origen, to whom he made direct reference. According to the inscription over the grave of Hippolytus composed by Pope Damasus, he was a follower of the Novatian schism while a presbyter, but before his death exhorted his followers to become reconciled with the Catholic Church. Believed to have been a disciple of Irenaeus of Leon and a strong opponent of opinions he considered heretical, Hippolytus came into conflict with popes of his time and for some time headed a separate congregation. The result was a schism, and for perhaps over ten years Hippolytus stood at the head of a separate congregation, giving him the distinction of being the first antipope, as well as later a martyr and saint. Hippolytus was part of a group of conservative church leaders opposed to Pope Calixtus I. 217 to 222, when he announced that even Christians who had committed grave sins could be forgiven. His reign in opposition to Calixtus lasted through the succeeding pontificates of Urban I, 222 to 230, and at least part of that of Pontian, 230 to 235. During or shortly after the pontificate of Pontian, the schism apparently came to an end. Under the persecution of Emperor Maximius Thrax, Pontian and other church leaders, among them Hippolytus, were exiled by the emperor to Sardinia in 235. The tradition that he was dragged to death by wild horses is apparently legendary. It is more likely that he, like Pontian, died as a result of forced mine labour. The bodies of the exiles were interred in Rome, that of Hippolytus in the cemetery of Via Tibertina, his memory was henceforth celebrated in the church as that of a saint and martyr. In our post-Reformation world, it can be hard to understand how a simple differing of ideas could create an anti-pope. I mean, people split and leave churches to start a new branch all the time now. We are used to seeing doctrinal disagreements in even the smallest denominations. There is a reason that there are roughly 45,000 different Christian denominations in the world now. However, at the time of St. Hippolytus, there was really only one true church, so this would have been significant. We now leap forward over 500 years to our next anti-popes in the hot seat, Constantine II and Philip. After the death of Pope Paul I in 767, a Roman noble named Toto of Nepi, I wonder if his wife was named Rosanna, entered the city with an armed force. Various factions contended to secure the appointment of their respective candidates as Pope, and Toto was no different. He ordered that his brother Constantine would become the next Pope. However, Constantine was a lay person, so in one day the church officials made him a deacon, priest, and then bishop before elevating him to the papacy. Constantine's rule only lasted a year, the 20th of June 767, to the 6th of August 768, before some rivals persuaded the King of the Lombards to intervene and marched on Rome. And marching on Rome, the Lombards killed Toto in battle. Constantine was imprisoned, and after a new Pope was elected, they had the anti-Pope excommunicated, blinded, tortured, his tongue cut out, and publicly humiliated before sending him to live the rest of his days in a monastery. Constantine's acts and rulings were then publicly burnt before the entire Synod of the Lateran Council in 769. However, before the new Pope, Stephen III, was elected, there was another anti-Pope kicking around. This was Philip, whom those same invading Lombards had tried to install as a replacement to Constantine. Philip was anti-Pope for one day, the 31st of July, 768. Mark that date in your diaries, people. The events surrounding Constantine II and Philip go to show one simple truth. In an age where strength of arms was the only currency worth having, it helps to have, well, strength of arms. Let's fly again through the centuries and see the next few anti-popes to explain the theological instability of the Middle Ages. This'll be fun. Clement III, 
Pope from 1019 to the 8th of September 1100, also known as Wibert of Ravenna, was the first anti-pope selected in a series of anti-popes designed to challenge the authority of the Pope by the Holy Roman Empire. This all began when the previous authentic Pope, Gregory VII, excommunicated Henry IV, Holy Roman Emperor, as he continued to see how far he could push papal temporal authority. As a side note, I have Pope Gregory VII set aside for an episode of his own in the future, and he would also be somebody I would invite to a dinner party if I could. Anyway, called the Investiture Controversy, it led to a state of war between the supporters of the papacy and the emperor. While Gregory VII was getting too big for his papal boots, Emperor Henry IV selected Wibbert as his pope. Wibbert was already known to have issues with Gregory, and so he was a good choice if you want to rock the theological political apple cart. However, without the Emperor's presence in Italy, after he had withdrawn in the face of growing opposition, Clement III's authority also shrank. Despite several subsequent popes after Gregory, Clement remained Henry IV's preferred pope. He often had control of Rome for the next 20 years, and this was the start of a line of anti-popes supported by the Holy Roman Emperor. The run of the anti-popes supported by the Emperor ended with Gregory VIII, who reigned from 1118 to 1121. He was eventually captured by the papal troops of Pope Calixtus II, 1119 to 1124, forced to surrender and was kept imprisoned in monasteries until his death in 1137. Next, we have a period stretching from 1305 to 1416. During these years, the church found its authority undermined, openly challenged and divided among rivals. Although it emerged at the end of this period with its authority seemingly intact, the struggle brought significant changes to the structure of the church and sowed seeds that would later sprout in the Protestant Reformation. This century of crisis can be divided into two periods of unequal length, the Avignon Papacy and the Western Schism. In the first phase, the popes were resident not in Rome, but in Avignon in southern France. This period began with Pope Clement V, 1305-1314, moving to Avignon in 1309, and concluded with Gregory XI, 1370-1378, moving the papacy back to Rome in the year of his death. Because a bishop is supposed to reside in the sea, this circumstance, which lasted from 1305-1378, to undermined the authority and prestige of the papacy. During this period, seven popes, all French, resided in Avignon. After 70 years in France, the papal curia was naturally French in its ways, and to a large extent in its staff. Back in Rome, some degree of tension between French and Italian factions was inevitable. This tension was brought to a head by the death of the French Pope Gregory XI. The Roman crowd, said to be in a threatening mood, demanded a Roman Pope or at least an Italian one. In 1378, the conclave elected an Italian from Naples, Pope Urban VI. His intransigence in office soon alienated the French cardinals, and the behaviour of the Roman crowd enabled them to declare, in retrospect, that his election was invalid, voted under duress. The French cardinals withdrew to a conclave of their own, where they elected one of their number, Robert of Geneva. He took the name Pope Clement VII. By 1379, Clement VII was back in the palace of the popes in Avignon, while Urban VI remained in Rome. Known as the Western Schism, it was primarily a political dispute. One pope was in Avignon, where he was supported by France, Aragon, Castile, Scotland and Naples, while another pope was in Rome, where he had the allegiance of England, the Holy Roman Empire, Poland and other city-states in Italy. Clement VII was the anti-pope in Avignon from 1378 to 1394, but he is perhaps best known for leading a mercenary army against the small city of Cesena in 1377, when he was a papal legate. When the city was captured, Clement ordered the massacre of between 3,000 and 8,000 civilians, an act which earned him the nickname the Butcher of Cesena. 
After Clement's death on the 16th of September 1394, the supporters of the Avignon papacy met and elected Pedro Martinez de Luna, an Aragonese noble and scholar, as their next pontiff, known as Benedict XIII. However, the European support for the Avignon popes went into decline during his reign, and Benedict is mostly known for instigating a number of acts against the Jewish community in Spain. But have no fear, for some of the church leadership met in Pisa to try and resolve this Pope anti Pope shenanigans. Their solution elect a totally unrelated Pope. They chose and elected the Archbishop of Milan, Pedros Philagos, now known as Alexander V. However, the Popes in Rome and Avignon refused to accept this council's decision and the situation now emerged where there were three rival pontiffs. Three popes. We have three popes, people, but still, three of them. And after Alexander's death, we got John the Twenty-Third, who was opposed to Gregory the Eleventh, the Roman claimant, and Benedict the Thirteenth, the Avignon claimant. Confused? I am. All I can see are Roman numerals everywhere. It would not be until the Council of Constance, held between 1414 and 1418, that the crisis was finally resolved with the election of Pope Martin V. Or was it? After the end of the Western Schism, the main dispute within the Church was over how much power the papacy should wield. In 1439, the Council of Florence decided to depose the sitting pontiff over this issue and elected Amadeus VIII, Duke of Savoy, as the new Pope. Taking the name Felix V, he tried to serve as Pope until 1449, but found little support in Europe. Eventually, he stepped down and became a cardinal, and is now considered to be the last of the antipopes. So there you have it, folks. The history of the antipopes in a nutshell. I know you're all thinking, but Daniel, you've already mentioned about a dozen antipopes, and you said there were 37. And you would be right. However, I was not about to go through all of their names here, was I? Why, yes. Yes, I will. The following are the antipopes I haven't mentioned this far, you lucky ducks. We have Novation, Heraclius, Felix II, Ursinus, Eulalius, Lawrence, Diasculus, Theodore, Pascal, John VIII, Anastasius III Bibliothecarius, which means the librarian, Christopher, Boniface VII, John XVI, Gregory, Benedict X, Honorius II, Theodoric, Alaric, Albert, Sylvester IV. Celestine II, Anacletus II, Victor IV, Victor IV, yes there were two, Pascal III, Callistus III, Innocent III, Nicholas V. And there you have it folks, the antipopes. Or is it? Because the Apostles of Infinite Love is an independent traditionalist, independent Catholic religious group, active in various parts of the world, with their headquarters being in Quebec. It was founded by Michel Collin, a French Catholic priest in Lille, who proclaimed himself Pope Clement the Fifteenth, after receiving a vision from God crowning him with a papal tiara, obviously initially heading a religious congregation that had Catholic Archdiocese approval, Jean-Gaston Tremblay, later known as Pope Gregor XVII, merged his religious community with the Apostles of Infinite Love and led it for the time. The Apostles of Infinite Love has attracted traditional Catholics unhappy with changes made during the Second Vatican Council. After the election of Pope Paul IV in the Catholic Church, in 1963, Michel Collin announced him as an anti-pope. Will it ever end? I'm sure you will all be glad to know that the end of this episode is definitely in sight. 
Who might have guessed that the Roman Catholic Church, with all its infallibility, could have such a history? Yeah, I think we all could have, really. For some 1,200 years, the papacy was plagued, from time to time, by alternative claimants. These individuals did it for personal gain, theological disputes, or just because they were mere pawns in the political and religious games which Europe is no stranger to. I have thoroughly enjoyed researching this topic, and as I warned at the beginning, I would be doing plenty of geeking out. It only leaves me to say thank you for listening. If you have enjoyed this episode, please take the time to listen back to previous ones. If you would like to give me a rating, a comment, or a follow, that would be awesome. You can find us on YouTube as well, where you can like and share the video versions of this podcast. We also have an Instagram at at cogito underscore ergo underscore pod, so please come along and give us a follow. So, for now, thank you for listening, and I will speak to you again soon.